I'm Rick Croslin, and I help young people learn science because science helps us answer questions about the world. And it's our very nature to ask questions, to explore, and to make discoveries. Well, for over 45 years, I've been helping and inspiring young people to dream, to make discoveries, to do things that helps them and the entire world. It's called teaching. So, you know, and I know that one day soon, a student somewhere in a classroom will grow up to walk on the moon or to land on Mars. But exploring and discovery and asking questions is not limited just to students. As a matter of fact, teachers like me also have those same dreams and aspirations to question, explore, and make discoveries. Well, today I'm revisiting a project that meant a lot to me in my life. And it was started back in 1984 by President Reagan, who announced the Teacher in Space program, and hence the, uh, the jacket <laughs> and uh, the outfit that I have on. And I'm kind of happy that after 35 years, this jacket and this costume still fits me. So the Teacher in Space program was an exciting time for teachers to apply to NASA to be one of the first educators or citizens to fly in space on the space shuttle, the STS, Space Transportation System. Over 40,000 teachers applied, 11,000 finished the very tough application, and it was down to 10 teachers were selected from across the country to go into the final candidate program. I was fortunate and lucky enough to be the alternate for Indiana, which meant Bob Forrester, who went on to be in the top 10, got to participate in a lot of cool NASA projects. Um, but soon it's gonna be the 35th anniversary of the Challenger tragedy. Now to many people watching this, it's another day in history. It's a horrific lesson, but for many teachers, it's an inspirational lesson because of the teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe. Krista McAuliffe was a teacher, a mother, a scout leader. She taught social studies in American history, and she emphasized the importance of ordinary people in history. And she thought their contributions, like I do, are just as important as politicians, kings, and generals. It's ordinary people that do extraordinary things, like Krista McAuliffe. So she, unfortunately, uh, gave the ultimate sacrifice along with six other astronauts on that terrible day on January 28, 1986, when the Challenger had behalf on that terrible explosion. And I remember sitting in my, my classroom, my school at Chapel Glen Elementary with the entire grade level watching the launch. And it's really, really hard to explain how we all felt on that day. But any loss, no matter how long it's been, is still a terrible loss for our nation and for the families of those seven astronauts. But I'm here today to commemorate the good that the science and the NASA program and the teacher in space program does, and that is to get kids excited about learning science and particularly aerospace and space science. So this particular machine right here, the space shuttle, was a fabulous machine. It was very complicated with over 101 critical things that could go wrong. And it has it's the unique ability of being something that could take off like a rocket while it's lifting on these two SRB solid rocket boosters and this giant tank, ET, external tank of hydrogen and oxygen, and it's painted orange because it was covered in this, SOFI, sprayed on foam insulation. NASA loves acronyms. This came from Marshall Space Flight Center. I collected on a trip there. So as this machine complicated rocket takes off, as many have said, on the pillars of fire to go into space. These two SRBs, solid rocket boosters, and these three main engines, and the two orbital maneuvering system engines 
take this higher and higher into space. Now you might say, where does space start? And that's hotly debated. Is it 50 miles, 62 miles? But NASA considers space, the start of space at 50 miles. The space shuttle is designed to go up further than that, possibly up to like 220 miles or maybe even 200 and maybe 30 miles, about where the International Space Station is now. It ends up using up the fuel in these SRBs, solid rocket boosters that are jettisoned, parachutes come out and reused. And now it's going faster and faster, trying to get to a speed of like 1,700 miles per hour, going around the earth every 90 minutes, sunset, sun, sunset, sunrise every 45, until it uses up most of this fuel in these main engines. And then this is jettisoned because of friction, it burns up. And we now have from a rocket to a space vehicle. Now, one of the first things it has to do when it gets into space, all that heat that's generated, and I have another model that I made years ago, it, the first thing it does is it opens up its cargo bay doors because the space shuttle is actually like a giant space truck, if you will. It took up payloads, and this is uh, uh, the space lab that was, can be put in it, and it even took up the Hubble telescope using the Canadian arm to put it there, and this is pretty amazing. So that's in space, and it doesn't have to be aerodynamic because when it's in space, there's no air molecules, and so it's not gonna be slowed down by the friction of air. So they complete their mission, and their mission is really three different things. You can study the Earth, you can study the, the outer space, or you can do experiments on board the laboratory of how things behave in space. And I'll get to that in just a second. So now you stay up there at your, your mission, going or orbiting the Earth in communication. It's time to come back. But you're going 7,750 miles an hour. So the first thing they do is they do a, a orbit deburn, a, a deorbit burn by turning the vehicle around. There are 40 plus little rockets all outside of this called the reaction control system. Oh, Isaac Newton for reaction. There's an opposite and equal reaction to get this thing turned around until it's going backwards, orbiting the Earth. Of course, they don't know it's backwards because you're in microgravity, a free flaw that uh, mimics the curvature of the Earth. So it's like you're falling and traveling at the same time. So it seems like you're weightless, but you still have your mass. And here's this massive vehicle going around the Earth. It has to slow down. It fires the OMS, orbiting maneuveral systems, and burns about three or four minutes to slow it down, to slow it down, to slow it down, so it can re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Using the RCS, Reaction Control System, brings it back down. And so what was a rocket, a space orbiting space laboratory, now is coming back as a glider. A glider that's got a pretty steep glide, and it needs to land, it could probably land at any large airport, They've landed at Edwards Air Force Base on, the, on the, the dry desert salt flats, or they've also tried to land back at Kennedy Space Center where they come in about 215 miles an hour and touch down on the landing gear and the nose comes down and the parachute's deployed and the back uh, uh, tail splits open to give it more drag because drag is the opposing force of thrust and then this can be refurbished and used again. Now, as it's coming into the Earth, it generates so much heat that the air ionizes around it, and that's called the LOS, loss of signal. And that's where you get these tiles. It is covered in space shuttle, these tiles, that have the unique characteristic of being able to protect the orbiter from incredible temperatures, thousands of degrees. Let's see if I can do this here, let's see what. So you can heat up this side, of the shuttle tile and it's extremely hot but within a minute it's cooled down and it protects the vehicle as long as these are kept intact. So it's also got the nickname of the flying brickyard uh, because of all of those shuttle tiles. So that is basically how the space shuttle and how it was made so many missions up into space. Over 130, I believe, it had gone into space, bringing astronaut after astronaut. 
Now, what do you do in space? Well, it's a cool environment to learn so much. And the first question kids like to know is, how do you eat in space? And this is a reproduction that we made of a table. Now, so it's kind of a strange thing because there's no table in space because you can't sit down in space. It's kind of like you're in an elevator and someone cuts the cable and you're falling and having free fall, which is really great uh, until you get to the bottom of the shaft. No, wait a minute, that's a bad analogy. It's kind of like you, you're driving your car off a cliff that's uh, 100 miles high and you have a lot of fun. No, that's a bad analogy. Anyway, free fall or free flight or microgravity is because the inside of the flight deck of the orbiter you are living, sleeping, going to the bathroom and eating. So you can't sit down. And so Velcro plays an important part. This is a table that can be strapped onto you. And these containers also can be reconstituted as food. Now you think, why did they go up dry? It costs on average $10,000 per pound to take something up in space on the space shuttle. So NASA, along with a lot of companies, learned to dehydrate because the solar panels on the shuttle actually produced electricity and one byproduct was water they could use to reconstitute this. Now these are kind of cool, kind of fun things with magnets and Velcro. There are two very important things on this. The first one is scissors. Since most of the items are in pouches, if you lose your scissors, you're in trouble because you can't open a lot of your food. And the second one is this thing right here, which is a straw. Now on earth, if I, make a partial vacuum and I can pull up the drinking in microgravity, that liquid would continue to be stuck to the rest of the liquid and it'll be floating around, which is a big problem in space. So there's a little clip right here. After you take a drink, you clip it shut. And so keeping the air filters free of things floating around is, is a big problem. But it is a lot of fun. You can see videos about this like M&Ms. If I wanted to eat an M&M or you wanted to eat an M&M, I could take an M&M and I could just push it right into your mouth, which is kind of cool action reaction. Uh, one of the best things, I like French fries. So how do you put ketchup on French fries? Well, ketchup is kind of sticky. I guess you'd squirt some ketchup inside the cabin. Then you take your French fry and try to loop around it. But I wonder if you have any idea what these two food items are for. Ah, <laughs> salt and pepper, liquefied. Can you imagine trying to put salt on? It's not gonna go down because the apparent microgravity, it would just be there. And now you got one of your uh, crewmates over there sleeping. And here comes da, 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 salt up their nostrils or in their eyes. Very big problem. As a matter of fact, if they got it, they would start to cry if they got that pepper, but tears don't drop down. In fact, the tears would just form a, like a lens across your eye. Now you could shake your head and make them go. Speaking of how things act, both Pepsi and Coca-Cola wanted to be the first in space. And they actually sent them both at the same time. This is from the Young Astronaut Program, which I actually had a, a catalog doing that. But if you take a look at this, this was used to actually spray a mixture of Pepsi into you. Now, I think it'd be kind of cool to do old Isaac Newton action reaction, depending on your mass and the velocity of this gas. Cool science. And so the best way I think to learn about microgravity is you can look up something called toys in space where they took a variety of things that we know how they work on earth, like do magnets work in space? This is stuck to it. And on earth, gravity pulls this down. But in space, I'd have to get it going with some other types of forces, but would it still go? If I let go, would it go? Would a gyroscope work in space? And what am I, magnets in space. Now, this is a game that a lot of kids don't play any longer, but maybe you do. Uh, pick up jacks with the jacks and a rubber ball. On Earth, you drop it, you pick up jacks. That'd <laughs> be a problem in space. As a matter of fact, they even took a toy car. How do you get a car to go downhill if you're on the space shuttle? And I guess one of my favorite, uh, besides a yo-yo and uh, one of these paddle boards. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen these, but I didn't know these came with a ball. When I was a kid, my mom always just had this, but I found out later, these actually come with a ball. How would that work in space? Do rubber bands work in space? And I guess one of my favorite, they took this guy up 
And let's see, this is a, a no energy. Let me give it some potential elastic uh, energy. And I'm gonna see if this guy will do what he's supposed to do on Earth. On Earth, he does this, flips. I wonder what he would do in space. Now you can learn about this and so much more by going to the nasa.gov website and look up toys in space. So although this is the anniversary of a terrible tragedy, I hope you use this opportunity to learn about space, to learn about science. And uh, if you go into space and you wanna sleep, uh, do you need a pillow? And if you do need a pillow, uh, where does it go? I guess you'd have to uh, Velcro it onto your head somehow in order for you to uh, stay asleep. <laughs> so uh, there's so much to learn about space and I hope you use this opportunity to do some research and who knows, one day you may be operating a vehicle that goes to space. So I hope you uh, have enjoyed this short video and remember, many people have said it from Gene Cernan to Krista McAuliffe, reach for the stars because even if you don't attain them, you'll land somewhere that's pretty amazing and you might have questions and you might have explorations and you might make new discoveries.